Christine Lecoz is called to the cemetery. I was damn sure I wasn't going to help Vasey murder anyone. So certain that I'd given up worrying about it. I was in the office. It was about half past nine, cold and raining outside. The office was dark. I'd been trying to work out my tax, but had switched off the light to get some sleep. I managed to fall asleep in the nice chair I keep for clients use. And then I was awoken by the telephone. Ringing, then stopping. Ringing, then stopping. It started off as something in my dream, but I woke to find it still buzzing away in the real world. I considered letting it ring until whoever it was got the message that I wasn't in. I shouldn't have been in. Any regular person would have been at home with wife and kids. It must be a wrong number. Nobody would ring an office at that time in the evening. Let it ring. But to tell the truth, I never can let a telephone ring. Curiosity always drives me to pick it up. I lifted it from the desk and put the earpiece against my ear, the mouthpiece four centimetres from my mouth, just as I'd been taught in the army, the right way to answer a telephone. I said, The Coes, yes? A refined English voice spoke. Thank God you're in. It rang for ages. I need your help. I've got to do it tonight. I can't afford to wait. You must come and help me. Mr Vasey, uh, you're lucky to catch me in the office. I've telephoned Oderberg at his hotel and left a message for him to come too, but you're much stronger than he is. Mr Vasey, can you just calm down and try to tell me what the matter is? I spoke in a relaxed tone, like I would to soothe a dog that had got itself a bit worked up. One of them came to my house today. They know I'm on to them, and they'll strike back at me, so I'm not going to wait for them. I have a stake. I'm going to finish her. I'm going to Brompton Cemetery. You come there and help me with the gates and the coffin lid. He sounded drunk, delusional, and terrified. I said, I think you should stay at home. I'll come round straight away. Uh, we can talk about it there. Vasey snapped. No, I'm on my way to Brompton Cemetery now. Do you know where that is? Hang on a minute, Mr Vasey. Don't you think you should reflect on this? I don't know what you're going to do, but why don't you at least wait until daylight? Can you find Brompton Cemetery? Do you have a map of London? The old officer's tone had come out in his voice. Yes, I had a map, all right. I'll see you there in three quarters of an hour. Then he hung up. I could have let him go and get wet alone, but I sighed and put on my raincoat and hat. I got to the door and then I went back and got my pistol. A luger. A souvenir, along with its shoulder holster. I took off my raincoat and my suit jacket and put it on. I don't believe in ghosts, but I do believe that all sorts of weird and dangerous people lurk around city cemeteries on dark winter nights. That's why I took the gun. Down the steps and out into the rain, hat down, collar of my raincoat up. The car was parked round the corner, a Citroen. I didn't import it myself. I got it second hand in London. More out of habit than patriotism, because that was the kind of car I'd driven in Paris. I got in, engine on, lights on, pulled out onto the roadway, and off we went, me in the car, heading west. I figured I'd go towards Earl's Court and then consult the map book under a convenient street lamp. The windscreen wipers rhythmically swished the rain away. The engine hummed and I squinted through the wet glare of other people's headlights on my windshield. Vasey was an adulterous, patronising member of the privileged classes. He wasn't particularly likeable, but he paid me, so I figured I owed him some loyalty. I felt sorry for him too. I didn't doubt he thought he'd seen his dead wife come back to haunt him. It doesn't matter what's real. What counts is what you think is real. Whatever the reason, whether my loyalty had been bought or that I was just a nice guy. I was on the road to Brompton Cemetery. I found the big iron gates easily enough, so I parked the car nearby and got out. The rain had intensified, and it was coming down at a 45-degree angle, blown around by the wind. I'd seen Vesey outside the gates as I drove past, and I walked quickly over to him. The gate of the cemetery was chained up. He stood there, both his hands on the metal bar, shaking it in a rage with the gate for being locked. He didn't have a coat on, was wearing his business suit, which by now was wringing wet. 
Near his feet was a piece of sharpened wood that looked like it had once been the leg of a table. The whole thing was like a bad black comedy. I got close and put my hand on his shoulder. He knew it was me, but he still flinched. I said, come on, let's go. You come in my car and I'll pick yours up tomorrow for you. After a minute I realised he was sobbing, angry, frightened sobs. He looked at me, his face wet and his hair plastered over his forehead. He was very disturbed. I had to talk him out of this and get him some psychiatric help. In the gloom, it looked like he had black holes where his eyes should have been. Making small, broken cries, he whimpered, and all the time stared at me. It was embarrassing to see anyone in such a state. I kept my hand reassuringly on his shoulder. Why don't we go and find someone who can help? He said, Tasman got away from me. I knew she'd tell Margaret, so instead of waiting for her, I've come here. I saw Margaret before you came. In there, he gestured through the gates. If you don't help me, she'll kill me. We must get to her tomb and destroy her there. I tried to pull him. Come on, Mr. Vasey. Come away. He snarled. Nobody believes me. Even you don't. I shrugged uneasily. I believe that you think you've seen your dead wife. And I believe that you're very frightened. He took his hand back and slapped me across the face. It stung. He was pushing my sympathy. Who are you to accuse me of cowardice, you foreign gutter snipe? He shook his head and started laughing to himself, the rain dripping from the locks of hair. How clever they are. How oh, they're enjoying using my faults against me. I lied so much to Margaret about the other women that no one now believes me. He stared at me. If you won't help me, you can sign me to my death. Then, unexpectedly, the fight went out of him. Please help me, Lucos. I said, look, you're going to catch your death of cold. You're wet through. Here, have my coat to stop you getting any wetter. It was rather a futile gesture, but I took off my coat and put it over his shoulders. I tried to pull him along to the car, but he planted his feet. He still wanted me to go into that bloody cemetery. Then, in front of us, out of the rain, a dark, solid figure in a black top coat and Homburg hat separated out of the murk. Vasey recognised him before I did. He was Oderberg. Vasey greeted him effusively. Oderberg eyed me suspiciously, but said politely enough, Mr. Lecose as well. How pleasant to meet you again. Just like we were at some social function, eating Zacher Torte and drinking Reisling, instead of sanding in the pissing rain outside a cemetery at midnight. I took Oderberg by the arm and left Vasey where he was, still wearing my overcoat. Oderberg stiffened when I touched him, but he came with me, just a few paces, just out of earshot of Vasey. I said, I hope to God you aren't going to encourage him with all this vampire nonsense. The man's sick. I'm not a doctor, but even I can tell he needs medical help. Your dedication to your employer is creditable, he said, but you mistake why I'm here. We're in no position to move against this thing now, not in the hours of darkness. I came by taxi as quickly as I could to rescue Vasey before she killed him. Before she killed him? I raised my eyebrows and the rain streamed into my eyes. I wiped them with the back of my hand. Uh, whatever you say. Can you help me get him back to my car? It's just up behind you there. Oderberg came with me and got hold of Vasey's other arm. Vasey fixed his feet on the ground. You're both going to betray me then. He sounded infinitely weary. Together, Oderberg and I tried to move him in the direction of the car. He struggled against us. I may not have another night to do this, Oderberg said. Come on, Andrew. We cannot fight her tonight. She'd certainly kill us all. Let us go to the car. I think because he talked like he believed him, Oderberg managed to calm Vasey down. Vasey walked with us along the sidewalk, back the couple yards to the car. On our right was the road with very little traffic, and on our left were tall, spear-topped iron railings mounted on a low brick wall. I opened the car door and Oderberg helped Vasey into the back. I sat in the driver's seat and switched on the engine. I was glad to be out of the rain. Vasey was in and Oderberg walked round the car to the other door. Then Vasey shrieked, She's there, through the railings! Oderberg was getting into the passenger side. Suddenly he stopped and stood up to look over the top of the car. I couldn't see anything through the rain-soaked window. 
Vasey slammed me on my shoulders with the palms of his hands. Drive, for the love of God, drive! What the hell is happening? I shouted, though I knew I'd get no sense out of Vasey. Oderberg jumped into the car. He looked terrified as well. Drive, drive! I threw my hands up and then pushed the gear stick into first. Vasey was screaming at me. She's coming over the railings! I still couldn't see anybody through the windows or in the mirror. I moved off, but not in a tearing hurry. They were both hysterical about something, but dead women don't walk. Then there was a heavy thud on the back of the car. I half turned round. Vasey was beside himself. He was getting on my nerves. I snapped, What did you do then? But the steering of the car felt suddenly heavy. I turned to Oderberg. His eyes were white. He said, She must be on the roof. You must shake her off. There was something on the roof. I could feel the weight of it affecting the steering and acceleration of the car. It must have been a tree branch. But their fear was infecting me. I put my foot on the pedal and the car speeded up. Then there was an almighty smash and I heard the back window break and felt the rain and cold air from outside. Vasey screamed something. I looked at Oderberg, who could see better than I could. What's happened? He was shaking. He hissed through his teeth. She's through the window. I said, that's enough. And I slammed the brakes on. Suddenly... The weight was gone. I'd thrown it off. Oderberg said, Go! You're saying that I've thrown a woman into the street and you want me to leave her? We were stopped in the road. Oderberg was still trying to control himself. It is not a woman. I shook my head. I didn't know what I believed, but woman or no woman, something had been on the car and I wanted to see what it was. I moved to open the car door. Oderberg grabbed my arm painfully tight. I said tersely, let go of my arm. No, you must just drive us away. She's not dead. She will get up and come for us. I looked in my mirror. I could see something, a white shape in the middle of the road. It was moving. Vasey wailed from the back. Please go, please, she's coming for us. Their fear had got into me. There couldn't have been a woman on the roof. No one punches holes in the window of a moving car. It must have been a tree. But I drove off. Oderberg managed to get Vasey to quieten down. The shrieking stopped and he began moaning to himself. We didn't speak for some time. When we were coming up to West Kensington, I said, Where to? To his house. I can't bring him to the hotel in this state. We turned down towards Earl's Court. Now we were calm. What the hell was it really then? I asked. It was Margaret Vasey, Oderberg said. I bit my lip for a quarter of a mile while I thought about what he'd said, and then I said, This is madness. Oderberg turned to me. It is difficult to understand, and it is very strange, but it is not madness. We parked outside Vasey's house. Vasey was quiet now and looked like he didn't know where he was. I examined the glass in the back window and where it had spilled under the car seat. It was jagged, but there wasn't any sign of blood on it. Oderberg was beside the car. I said, So you're telling me you really think that was Vasey's dead wife? Yes, Mr. Lecoz, and we are very vulnerable to her. He helped me to get Vasey into the house. I checked on my wristwatch and saw that it was after one. Vasey let me lead him upstairs to his bedroom. He didn't say much, at least not much that made any sense. The room was a mess. The bed hadn't been made, probably for days. Despite the expensive furnishings, the whole place smelled of cigarettes and stale sweat. There was a woman's dressing table under the window, but it was covered with men's things, a hairbrush, some loose change, a handkerchief. The small pane at the top of the window was open, letting in rain, which had soaked the drapes. I closed the window and pulled the curtains together. The bed was a big double one. This must have been the room they'd shared together. There was another single bedroom next door which looked like a woman's. Maybe he snored. Or maybe it was just the thought of his constant infidelities that sent her away. I let Vasey slump on the bed. Oderberg had followed us up. I rubbed my eyes. Do you want to undress him or shall I? Oderberg said, he's very wet. Here, let let me help you. We wrapped Vasey in towels that Oderberg found in the bathroom along the landing and put him under the sheets. He'll be lucky if he doesn't get pneumonia. You seem very calm, after what you've seen, Mr. Lecoz. I sat down in the chair by the dressing table and took off my hat, leaving a wet ring on my forehead. I'm not sure what I have seen. 
a broken branch, something on the road. Vasey's wife, Margaret. Yeah, yeah, sure. Vasey's dead wife, Margaret. Of course. Dead, Mr. Lacoste. Yet, she walked. I looked at Odeberg and he seemed anxious. I said, I've seen plenty of dead people, her Professor Odeberg, but none of them walked. So maybe you and Vasey got yourselves too excited. It was dark, hard to see. What about the broken glass? That was harder to explain. It didn't seem physically possible for a branch to fall on the roof then slide back and knock a hole in the glass the way it had. I shrugged. And didn't you see her in the road when you looked back? I saw something. I'm not sure it was a dead woman walking, though. He sat on a chair. I wanted a whiskey. He was putting me on edge with his incessant insistence on things that could not be. I shook my head and laughed. He said, I do not think you like me. Don't like anyone much. Maybe one day we will sit down and drink a beer together. He was trying to be friendly. I just shrugged. Then, in a gruff, back-to-business manner, he said, But first, we must think about Margaret Vesey. I said, It's late. I'm past thinking. I'm sure you can think for both of us, Professor. Whatever we believe, Mr. Lucose, Margaret Vesey is a vampire. She feeds on our life. The female vampires take semen from men and give blood. The males are opposite. They are like our mirrors. I don't know whether she'll return to her husband tonight. Perhaps she is feeding from him. We cannot leave him here on his own. I didn't mind sleeping on Vasey's sofa rather than on my office desk. I shrugged. I can stay here. He said, I still don't think you realize how dangerous Margaret Vasey is. I tried to humor him. You go along back to your hotel. I'll be all right here with Mr. Vasey. I've got my gun. I took out the Luger from under my coat. Yes, I saw that earlier, but it will do you no good. Their flesh cannot be pierced by bullets. She is not real, in the sense that your bullets are real. I sighed. Oh, what do you suggest, then? We're very vulnerable to her here, but two things are in our favour. The sooner he said his piece, the sooner I could get some sleep. His voice became intense. Firstly, the vampires are creatures of another place. They do not belong here amongst the living. Margaret cannot come into a place unless she is invited in. And secondly, I have something that will protect us, but it is not here. It is back at my hotel. Well, go and get it then. I'll stand guard. Oderberg looked at me hard. You're either very courageous or just stupid. I prefer it with a first, but people tell me it's a second. You're not afraid to be here without me, he said. I didn't know whether to laugh at him or not. He was a fifty-five-year-old academic with a thick waist from lots of Wiener schnitzel. We were a couple of miles away from the cemetery. You think a taxi will pick her up uh, wearing a shroud? He looked at me like I was a slow pupil. You really must believe me, Mr. Lecos. Margaret Vasey is very powerful. Look, Professor, you go back to your hotel and stay there if you want. We'll be fine. No, I will return. Do as you see fit. I'm sure Andrew would welcome you back if he could stop mumbling to himself. Oderberg went to the door of the bedroom. I followed him downstairs with a backward look at Vasey in the bed. He was staring at the ceiling, muttering. I switched the lights off and left him in the hope he'd go to sleep. When we got to the bottom of the stairs, Oderberg said, If I can hail a cab, I will. Otherwise, I will walk as fast as I can. I held out my keys. You take my car. I can't drive. I'll be very quick. Sure. He looked worried to be leaving me alone, but I was relieved finally to get rid of him. I watched him go and then went through to the drawing room, where I cleared the Bible and bits of paper and other books off the sofa. I threw my wet coat and hat over a chair, and I found that there was still some whiskey left in one of the bottles. I couldn't find a clean glass, so I took the bottle with me to the sofa and sat down. For comfort's sake, I kicked off my shoes and untied the shoulder holster, slinging it and the heavy weight of the luger onto the floor. I drank a little whiskey. As I drank more whiskey, I realised how tired I was. Sleep crept up on me. I closed my eyes, and I drifted.
I wasn't asleep, but I wasn't fully awake either. Vaguely, I heard a tapping, like the branches of a tree on the window. That was all it was. There was a tree outside in the garden. The wind had probably got up. I could still hear Vasey muttering to himself upstairs. It was beginning to get on my nerves, and I thought about shutting the door to the drawing room. But I didn't, because I didn't want to leave him alone in case he woke up in a confused state. He was still muttering. The branch was still tapping, like someone wanting to come in. I lay there trying to sleep. The world became strange and fluid as I approached the boundaries of dreamland. I heard a creak upstairs and sat up. What the hell was Vasey doing? Sounds in an unfamiliar house always make me edgy. There could be anything. Another creak. I stood up. I listened, trying to silence my breathing and the beating of my heart so I could hear. Yes. There was someone moving about upstairs. Vasey must have got up. I thought about leaving him be. Maybe he just wanted to go to the bathroom and would get back into bed. There was more movement. I thought I really should go and make sure he didn't do something stupid to himself. Oderberg and his stupid talk had made me nervous. I told myself not to be so idiotic. But I picked up the Luger. I quietly made my way into the hall and listened at the foot of the stairs. I could hear Vasey's voice from behind the half-closed door of his bedroom above. I could hear a bed squeaking and the sound of moaning. What the hell was he doing? I knew what it sounded like, but that usually takes two. I went up the stairs slowly. I didn't want to alarm him. I got across the landing and waited outside his door. It definitely sounded like a couple were making love inside the room. I put one hand on the door and slowly opened it. In the half-light, Vasey turned towards me. He was on top of a woman, her legs wide and wrapped around him. She was moaning. There was something wrong. I switched the room light on. The woman underneath was pale, wrapped in a shroud ripped open to expose the waxy flesh of her breasts. Her skin was stained with wet clay. Vasey's mouth was streaming with blood as he suckled at the dark venous fluid oozing from his dead wife's neck. And then Margaret turned and looked at me. Her dark eyes were malevolently alive, but not in the least human. She wasn't interested in me. Her brown wavy hair spread on the pillow. She closed her eyes again as if in ecstasy as he sucked at her throat. It was true. She was dead. But she still moved. A surge of terror mixed with revulsion hit me. I shouted and tried to push him off her. Then I pulled the trigger. The gun went off with a deafening bang in that enclosed space, but my aim was way off and the bullet missed, shattering the window and letting in the wind and rain. I started to retch with fear. On the bed they continued to couple, he faster and faster into her cold body, until with a cry he came to orgasm. She moaned in greed and delight. I vomited. When I straightened up, wiping the bile with the back of my hand, I saw her turn him over with precision, taking hold of him and pinioning him against the bed with a knee on either side. He started to fight, to kick and struggle against her. She leaned over his neck and lowered her head. With one hand in his hair, she pulled his head aside to bite. His neck cracked, and she mouthed at his artery as blood spouted out. I think that was to kill him. But it wasn't his blood she wanted. She spat it out, and as he lay dying, she moved down and fastened her mouth there. She was like an insect catching a beetle and draining its juices with its mouthpiece. I watched her rhythmically take the life fluid out of him, and with each mouthful of blood and semen he deflated, while she became more bloated like a fat grub. I felt my stomach heave again. Finally I managed to stand up. I was too terrified now to be sick. Half interested, Margaret looked up at me, but she continued to feed from Vasey. I backed over to the window. There was no way I could get to the door. 
Just as I got to the window, she unfastened from Vasey and sat there on her hands and knees, staring at me, like an engorged tick ready to drop off one victim and seek another. I went to the shattered window and jumped. It was about five metres, but below was bare soil made soft mud by the rain. I tried to roll to cushion my fall, but I went sprawling. I got up and panic cut free in me, and I leapt over the wall and out into Warwick Road. I ran, and when I stopped, I didn't know where I was. For the first time I dared to look back. She hadn't followed me. I don't know why she'd let me get away. Perhaps it was because she was no longer hungry. It was daylight before I went back to Vasey's house. It had stopped raining, but it was still cold. I couldn't bring myself to leave him, even though I was sure he was dead, so I'd waited and shivered until the light conjured up my courage again. Oderberg was at the door of the house waiting for me. He said, I saw you through the window. He's dead, upstairs. I've just left him. I, I jumped out of the window. Even now, in the daylight, and was wary about going in. Oderberg saw that and said, It's all right. She's not here any more. I told him what had happened. I've seen some terrible things. But nothing like that. He put his hand on my shoulder. She is a symbol of the devouring mother, a thing from nightmares. I missed. I was so horrified I, I couldn't shoot straight. He lowered his head. I should have been there to help you. We went into the house. I felt myself tremble. Trying to get control, I picked up my hat, coat and shoes. Then I remembered what I'd seen and threw up again. Oderberg stood there looking sympathetic. Staring up the stairs, I said, what about Vasey? I couldn't bring myself to go back into that bedroom. Do we tell the police? I can't give evidence about this. Oderberg said, I think to involve the police would complicate things and stop us from getting on with what we have to do. We left the house behind us. It was still very early, and I hoped no one would see us leave. I walked with him back to my car and gave him a lift to the De Vere Hotel where he was staying. As we got out, he said, so, Mr. Lacos, do you believe me now? I put my head in my hands. Eventually I said, Things like that should not exist. Then he said, It's quite simple. We must go to her tomb during the day, when she'll be dormant. Then we must destroy her. We were nearly at the hotel steps when I asked, Tell me, how does Lazar fit into all of this? In a sense, I believe he is Margaret's father. So, how are you going to kill her? I said it over bacon and eggs in the Divi Hotel with an air of perfect normality. I'd had a bath and examined my sore ankle, then Oderberg treated me to breakfast. I had an acid stomach scoured out by what I'd seen and I was ravenous. Instead of the sweet white tea preferred by the English, both Oderberg and I took black coffee. He said, I have a weapon. A dagger. In fact, I came to London to get it. That, and to meet Vesey. What use is a dagger? He ignored me and took a sip of coffee, then buttered some toast. He continued, I wanted to meet Vesey because I thought he could lead me to the vampires. I got the dagger because it can kill vampires. I took a bite of my breakfast. So, have you ever killed a vampire before? I said it, like it was the most natural thing in the world. No, he hesitated, then began tentatively. But I have read much. I have read everything I could find about them. The dagger is made of a metal that can kill them. A metal originally not of this world. Few things can hurt them, and they make a point of tracking down and destroying any weapon made of this metal. I thought that the dagger would be a lure for them. You wanted to lure them? I was incredulous. I had my own reasons for that. The men on the next table were talking about cricket. Another man was doing a crossword. Waiters brought in toast from the kitchen. He shrugged. At times I've thought myself mad. I've studied alchemy. The alchemists struggled to create an immortal spirit body. They prayed to God that their work would be rewarded with the philosopher's stone, the true gold. The alchemists believed it was possible to purify oneself to create this uh, philosophic child. 
Do you know anything about the Kabbalah? I shook my head. It is a Jewish mystical system. It talks about the tree of life, but there is also the obverse side, the tree of death. If you like, the alchemists worked on the tree of life and strove to create an immortal life. These vampires are the opposite of that child of immortal life, creatures of eternal death. But they are still immortal, Dibaldi said. Perhaps I can redeem her from immortality. I got a strange impression. He wasn't talking about Margaret Vesey. Uh, and this dagger, tell me how it's so special. He smiled at me. The three ingredients for the philosophical child are sulfur, our life energy, salt, our physical body, and mercury, our spirit. They are not to be confused with normal, sulphur, salt and mercury. The dagger is not made of a normal metal. It is made of Argentum Stellarum, star silver, otherworldly silver. This represents the philosophical mercury of the alchemists. This mercury is two-faced. It can give immortal life and it can consign one to eternal death. Star silver is not real, in the sense that iron or copper are real. It is a fiction, yet it exists. What about uh, wooden stakes and daylight? I thought they did the trick. That is all nonsense, folk tales. The second born arose in the 18th century or before in Eastern and Southern Europe. The stories say that, first of all, nothing could kill them. This metal, this star silver, is beyond good and evil. An alchemist called Thomas Kalinskov made this dagger for the Sultan. So when we finish breakfast, we go out and find Margaret Vesey asleep in her tomb and plunge this dagger into her. He nodded before taking a gulp of his coffee. I scratched my nose. But we're going to ask her a few questions first. Yes. And you haven't done this before? No. And apart from some historical books, you don't otherwise know whether this dagger will work on that thing we saw last night. He suddenly grew impatient with me. Mr. Lecose, you either trust me or you don't. You're either with me or you're not. There can be no room for doubting. There is only one question. Will you come with me to the cemetery? It struck me. There was no reason I should, except to make sense of what I'd seen and somehow fit it into the normal world before it brought the normal world tumbling down. I said, Yeah, I'll come with you. He relaxed. I guessed he hadn't wanted to go alone. He smiled and started talking about his wife and dog back in Vienna. He asked, And are you from Paris? No, I lived in Paris, but I'm from Brittany a little town in Finisterre called Douaranenes, at the edge of the world. Penarbed, we call it in Breton. So you're a Celt that explains the fiery temper. On my father's side, my mother's from Kansas, but her parents are from Krakow. East and West meeting you then. If you say so, Professor. How did your father and mother meet? Did he visit America? Well, I'm flattered you're so interested in me. I knew I'd find someone some day. He frowned. I apologize. I'm, I'm sorry for asking personal questions. I shook my head. I just can't help being snotty. It's my nature. He shrugged. I said, no. My father was a lecturer at the Sorbonne in Paris who liked music. She came over as part of a visiting American orchestra for the Paris exhibition in 1889. Things kind of went on from there. You come from quite a cultured background. I laughed. You sound surprised. He frowned. Uh, not at all, Monsieur Lecose. We all make our own choices in life. You're not like I imagine your parents to be. We went through to the lounge and ordered another cup of coffee in the big padded seats. I thought Oderberg was delaying going to the cemetery. The atmosphere was uncomfortable, either because of our conversation or because of what lay ahead. We sat there in silence. I finished my coffee and still he didn't say anything. He just sat there looking into space. God knows what he was thinking about. I started thinking about Vesey 
in that thing that had killed him, and remembering how I'd run away from it. The tension mounted slowly, but eventually I had to say, If we're going to do it, let's do it now. He looked at me and nodded hesitantly. You're right, but I'm frightened. It was the first time he'd admitted it. He got up, smoothed his trousers down, pulled his jacket straight, went off to the reception and spoke to the clerk there. Bellboys and waiters wandered around. Tourists sat reading newspapers, and in the lounge others sat around waiting for something. From time to time quite stunning women walked up to the reception desk, but I couldn't enjoy their beauty. I kept seeing Margaret Vasey and the trails of blood running down her face. Oderberg came back carrying a leather bag the size and shape of a doctor's bag. Time to go, he said. Oderberg followed me out to the car. I started the engine and we set off. He sat next to me, looking at the road with rapt attention, very neat in his suit and coat, smelling faintly of scented soap. It was drizzling again from the cold grey clouds. Shortly we pulled up outside Brompton Cemetery. I stopped the car and got out with him pulling my raincoat collar up to keep out the rain. I was shivering a little more than the temperature merited. Oderberg took out an oil lamp and another object wrapped in silk from his bag. I guessed that it was the dagger. He placed the bag in the car. He was being very precise and taking his time to do things properly, like a man who wants to put something off. I tapped my feet impatiently. Come on, let's get this thing done. He didn't look up but went carefully on with his preparations. In the daylight I could see the iron gates better and appreciate their gothic decoration. Last time I was there I was with a man who was now dead. I kept thinking of Margaret's face. The gates loomed before me. This time they were unlocked. Oderberg finished, stood up straight and put his hand on my arm in a reassuring kind of way, saying, Believe me, we must do this. I believe you. Let's just do it. Margaret was buried in Hampshire, but she came to London so that she could feed on her husband. She is using someone else's grave, uh, like a hotel, I said. He looked at me grimly, in no mood for my jokes. Uh, do you know which it is? I do. How? Faisy told me. He followed her here one night. You knew where it was. Why didn't you act before now? I was afraid to come on my own. Oderberg pushed the creaking gates open wide enough for us to enter. Without waiting for me, he strode off briskly toward the far end of the graveyard, and I did my best to catch up. As we hurried along, I saw the shape of the dagger through its silk cover, the skin on the back of my neck prickled. All around us were the monuments of the wealthy dead. We'd left behind the simple headstones, and now were surrounded with marble angels, anchors and the arms of Freemasons, as each tomb tried to present something of that which had filled the lives of those whose remains they contained. On that bleak, overcast morning, it was still too dark to read the inscriptions, even if I hadn't been walking so fast. The graveyard had corners still filled with shadows, lingering in the groves of yew trees, and behind the ivy-covered sepulchres. Oderberg found the crypt. It was an ornate marble tomb decorated in alabaster with statues in the mid-Victorian Gothic style. As I got closer, I could see that there was a door chained up with a new padlock. Damn, it's locked, of course, he put down the oil lamp. I went up and looked at the lock. It was a fairly standard one. I reached into my jacket pocket and pulled out a wallet that had in it various thin bits of metal. I fiddled around for about thirty seconds, finding and pushing the wards inside the lock with my twisted pin. The lock opened and fell onto the damp earth with a light thud. Hey, presto! Despite my joke, my hand had been shaking. Oderberg looked at me and said, You have some useful talents, Mr. Lacos. I have done it once or twice before. Strictly business, though. He pulled at the metal door of the sepulchre. I put my hand on his arm to stop him. It was shaking. It's daylight, I said. She'll be asleep, won't she? I don't know if they sleep, but she should be dormant. I pulled out the luger and showed it to him. He shook his head. Unnecessary and useless. I put it back into the shoulder holster. With a final tug, he managed to get the door open enough to allow us in. He was about to step down into the darkness when I grabbed his shoulder again. Wait while I light the lantern. 
I scrabbled with my lighter and lifted up the glass dome of the lantern to light the wick. It burned with a yellow flame that I adjusted. The air was suddenly filled with the smell of kerosene. We went cautiously down. My heart was in my throat. I'd imagined the crypt to go down quite a way, but after a few steps I could see shelves containing coffins in the pool of weak yellow light from the lantern. Some were old, but one was much fresher. I watched while Oderberg unwrapped the dagger. I saw it for the first time, ornate and oriental-looking. He said, The Ottoman dagger? He tried to smile, but his face was tense and it came out a kind of grimace. It was cold in the crypt. I wanted to get on with it before I lost my nerve or my mind. I said, I'm freezing. Come on. Let's do what we have to do. He walked over to the coffin, put down the dagger on the floor and said, Be careful not to step on it. It's too precious. Then he turned towards the shelf that held the newest coffin. Give me a hand. We struggled with the coffin, budging it slowly out of its niche. When we lifted it, I suddenly looked at him and said, It's very light. Let's just put it down. Oderberg nodded in the direction he wanted it put, and we lowered it onto the floor. He picked up the dagger and said to me, Lift the lid. I bent down. It's been nailed down, but the nails have come out. Just take off the lid. He raised the dagger above his head, ready to plunge it down with all his strength. I think he'd forgotten he wanted to ask us some questions, and I was glad. I gingerly got hold of the lid and lifted it. I fumbled it and almost dropped it. For God's sake, Likos, just take it off! I stepped back with the lid in my hands. Oderberg raised the dagger to strike. I couldn't see what was happening, but there was a grunt. It's empty! He put down the dagger. I felt a rush of relief. There was a long silence, and I asked Oderberg, What now? Oderberg turned towards me. They all need a coffin to rest in during the day. This wasn't safe for her. She knew that we would come and get her. She could be anywhere in London, but we must find her. She's killed Vesey, and if we don't stop them, both she and Lazar will kill again. I asked, What about Margaret's sister? He frowned. Who? Tasman Fitzgerald, the antique dealer. She visited Lazard, his house. He looked as if he'd been poleaxed. That woman is Margaret's sister. I nodded. Yeah, Vesey told me. Then she's either a vampire already, or will soon become one. <laughs>